Okay, so this is my absolute favorite lecture of the entire semester. Why? Because it's the thing that I specialize in, which is postmodern. Um, you'll see as we go through the slides that there are several issues that creep up with modern um, art. So, um, let's discuss them. I sure wish that we could be doing this in the classroom where we get to talk about our opinions and our ideas and all of that. So note that I am definitely missing you all in this time, um, but that I am glad that you are all safe and healthy and to tell you that I really will miss this particular class this semester because you all um, have grown to be some of my favorite students. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Sherry Levine. Sherry Levine um, is an appropriation artist. Her art poses the question, what is the role of the artist? Um, she begins to show re-photographed images by great revered modernist photographers like Edward Weston, Elliot Porter, Walker Evans. Um, and she takes these images from as early as 1981. Um, her choices were made quite deliberate amongst the gentrified godlike up their male names. Um, she played a shooting gallery game. She picked the most canonized names and the most culturally and ideological dense works. Um, the classic nude, the beautiful nature, the dignified depression poor. Um, so Sherry Levine practices at this time. Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. So Sherry Levine at this time has all the right theoretical drapery. Um, she addresses feminist issues. It is destructive practice and it's arguably, literally transgressive. She is taking pictures after Weston and saying, well, I'm a great photographer. I just took a picture of a Weston. And when you take a picture of a picture, it, it's um it's not the easiest thing to do and come up with the same read as the original photographer had um so levine finds herself attacking the feminist critic martha rosler for the inadequacy of simple quotation as a political strategy um she paraphrases Rosler and Rosler basically says, quoting and drawing attention to your work by others out of social and political modification just isn't enough because such work fails to deliver an alternative. Levine and others did, did however, inspire the practice of image scavenging, which was popular around art schools even today where images are shot or recorded from extant material found on TV and elsewhere. So this wave of appropriation and pastiche begins in the early 80s. It's still a popular practice today. Um, arguably, we don't see that these artists are anywhere near as groundbreaking as the first few decades of Dada and surrealist artists who use that everyday object and transformed it into art, into art object, an art object to unify and reconcile art and life. Postmodern uses of appropriation make no effort at healing the rift between art and life, keeping its dialogues in the rarefied and often exclusive domain of the gallery and its critically informed public. Pastiche using glossy magazine cutouts or TV material became a style in itself acceptable to the typical postmodern and the sense 
killing off the little remaining potential that these devices as weapons of critique. Postmodernism had shot itself in the foot by evolving into a style of sorts. Mass culture was reabsorbed in the postmodern critiques of itself, rendering the gestures limp and impotent. The thing I find about this that's so fascinating is that it all starts with Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol says, what is art? I can make a Campbell's soup can. I can copy a Brillo box. And if I do that, is it art? And then you have artists that come over after her, him and say, well, now, wait a minute. Duh. We think Edward Weston is one of the best photographers of all time. What if I take a picture of Edward Weston's art? Or what if I take a picture in the lens of Edward Weston? Then is my art any less art? So, one question I have for you. When you call me to discuss your grade is, is Sherry Levine's after Edward Weston, appropriation art, art. So you'll have to answer that question for me. I'm curious to see what you're gonna tell me. All right, well, some of the works of art that we look at, um, I haven't gone over Jeff Koons very well with you and so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Koons. We'll get back to him here in a minute. Okay, this is Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, Basquiat was an artist in the early 90s. And he lived in Brooklyn. His mom was um, American, I believe, and his dad was Haitian. No, no, I'm sorry. His mom was Puerto Rican, his dad was Haitian. And he... He got his start by doing graffiti around Brooklyn. He would um, tag with a certain symbol. And soon that symbol became synonymous with Basquiat. He hung around um, the community art center in his neighborhood. And he got to know other artists from that association. And Eventually, he meets someone who knows Andy Warhol fairly good, or fairly close, and they know where Andy Warhol hangs out. And so he go, starts hanging out at this bar that Andy Warhol hangs out at. And he meets Andy Warhol, and Andy Warhol falls in love with Basquiat's work. And so Basquiat spends uh, a good amount of time with Andy Warhol, discussing Warhol's art, discussing Basquiat's art, and together they do a show. The show wasn't real well received, um, and Basquiat was really devastated by that. So this is Basquiat and Andy Warhol hanging out together. They've got a leopard skin there behind them. Um, they did this show together, and you know, it just really didn't go well. Um, the critics were kind of harsh, and um, Basquiat had really sort of um, became an overnight sensation in art, um, partially just because he was in the right place at the right time. Um, he was willing to paint on things that most people didn't consider fine art objects. Um, he didn't have a lot of money and he grew up pretty poor. And so he would do things like, um, I don't know if you've ever been to New York, you know that you can walk along the street and people put their garbage out on the curb. And so he would, he would go grab like a door or an old window that somebody had thrown out and he would paint on it. 
And people would fall in love with the work that they saw of his. And they would come by and say, hey, I want you to paint this for me. And he'd say, okay, you have to give me uh, enough money to go buy the materials and then I'll give you your painting and you pay me for my work. And so he really um, very quickly became an overnight sensation. He also loved the party life that he had with Andy Warhol and the artists um, that he met in that area. He was friends with Keith Haring. Um, they were all part of the LGBTQ scene. If you go today to New York City to the um, uh, the LGBTQ like community center, there is a room there where Basquiat, Keith Haring, and Andy Warhol all had a meeting. Um, and there's a Basquiat sitting in the hallway in front of the room that Keith Haring um, painted. That's an incredible experience, you have to go. At any rate, my point being is that Basquiat really had a hard time dealing with the claim to fame. And he did a lot of the partying that um, was part of that scene. Unfortunately, Basquiat, about two years after he got big, ended up dying of a heroin overdose. Um, but I think the thing that we remember about Basquiat so much is that he really found his soul through painting. Um, Warhol worked his soul out through film and through photography. But Basquiat worked out how he defined himself through his painting. So let's look at that. This is a typical image of Basquiat. You can see it's highly colorful. Um, it's an image of three people, um, a white man, a red person, and an African-American person. Um, Basquiat often painted with quick, flat, geometric shapes, um, and he was highly influenced by Picasso and Cubism. He loved the um, abstract expressionists and how they um, looked at the process of art as art and he wanted to try to figure out how to tie into his soul the way they had. And so he sort of worked out his multicultural heritage, his um, economic challenges in life. There were times where he pretty much just lived on the streets of Brooklyn with friends couch surfing um, because he wanted to be in the middle of the creative scene. He was such an artist at heart that he needed that to feed his soul. Um, at any rate, here is an example of Basquiat's work. Um, we will look just a moment at the show that he and Andy Warhol put together. So this image of Andy Warhol this next painting is a really good example of how he would take a painting and make it um, symbolic of someone else. So this one is about jazz musician Charlie Parker, who Basquiat admired a lot. Um, Charlie Parker's nickname in the jazz world was Yardbird. And so you get these interesting images of the yacht, of the bird. Um, he likes to write on his paintings. He was very much into graffiti. Um, and you can just see sort of how his brain unfolds in the art. There's many layers of different meanings and different symbols. Um, that Basquiat references and in some ways we look at it and the finished product really doesn't seem like it's as important as the concept or the process in which Basquiat went through to get uh, what he has here. 
This is um, Prophet Number One by Jean Michel Basquiat. Uh, it was created. Oh, this one says it was created in 1982 in Italy. Um, it says it's a nod to Jackson Pollock. I, you know, I'm. I want to research that. I'm not real uh, confident about that. Uh, I do know that this particular work of art was sold to Lars Ulrich um, for five and a half million dollars. Um, Basquiat saw some of the fortune that he um, reaped or really earned through his work, um, but his work didn't really become quite as collectible and quite as desirable until after he passed away. At any rate, you can see that um, Jean-Michel Basquiat's um, cultural identity is heavily being worked out in this work of art. He, um, it, you know, he had a mom, he had parents who were from Puerto Rico and one of them was Haitian, and the voodoo culture there is really strong. Um, we studied the Vundun culture in Central Africa that was then carried into the United States due to the transatlantic slave triangle and the um, population of... Uh, Central Africans that were brought into Central America to work the sugarcane plantations. And so um, Basquiat's family came from that background and he worked out a lot of who he was and how he viewed himself and how others viewed him around him through this type of art. Okay, um, sorry, I had to take a little break. Had to uh, break up a dog squabble. At any rate, the Vundun culture was very much prominent in Basquiat's heritage, in Basquiat's um, cultural upbringing. Vundun is a African... Um, it's just an indigenous African belief system that was carried into um, Central America and made its way through to New Orleans. Um, and it is a mix of the West African or the Central African religion with Christianity. And so, um, it has a negative connotation, but um, I think that it was very much a part of Basquiat's life. It was very much a part of his working out how he saw himself and how the world saw him around him. Um, the primitivism that you see in this slide in terms of the way the face is drawn was intentional. I hate the word primitivism. I often refuse to use it because it has a negative connotation that African art is not done on a skill level that other Western European artists um, produce art. Uh, but in this case, describing the simplicity of the way that Basquiat draws um, is somewhat important to discuss the primitivism. Um, you can see that the um, planar analysis that Basquiat carries from cubism is prominent in this work of art. In addition to, you get this um, 
rapid feeling when you look at the work of art. It has this energy that really pops out of it, which is where they get the term neo-expressionism for Basquiat. Um, I wouldn't fully agree that we would, should call Basquiat's work neo-expressionism. His work is work where he's working out who he is as a human being, which is something we all do as artists. All right, so the next set of art that we're going to talk about is art of war and famine. Um, this work of art is by Burden. It's called All the Submarines of the United States of America, and it was done in 1987. Um, this is really Burden's epoch defending work. Um, it's made him one of the most important American artists to emerge since 1970. He had a 40 year career and he explored a variety of mediums, but um, this work specifically explores boundaries and constraints that were physical and moral limits, um, which were called into question um, he redefined the way we understand both performance and sculpture. His work has a socio-political context. In the 1990s, he begins a series of ambitious sculptures um, of increasing size and complexity using materials common to his childhood play activities. Um, he is American. He attended the Poma College um, in California and received an MFA from the University of California. This piece has 625 cardboard submarines. Submarines are all arranged in a way that makes them appear as if they are a school of fish. Um, schools of fish prowl in the water to attack for food or protection. And Burden is examining the idea of military power and asking the question of the viewer, is military power glorified here or questioned as a harmful entity? You see, the thing about contemporary artists is that they stand on the shoulders of the Dadaists. And by doing so, they have climbed the ladder of conceptual art. And so you get this interesting mix of art that has conceptual meaning and art that has beauty. And in the past, we've seen that art was separated that way. One was beauty, beautiful, and one was conceptual. Um, the Dadaists were experts at that, right? So they were experts at being able to take um, a fountain and turn it upside down and sign it and then recreate it many times by hand and have it be art. Um, the conceptual in that process is very, very important. It's almost more important than the art itself. Um, whereas here, Chris Burden takes the conceptual, uses it for a purpose, but also creates a very aesthetically pleasing and interesting work of art. Um, and I think today in the modern art world you have to be able to do more than just paint a pretty picture you have to be able to get someone to sort of stop and question and burden does that quite um, remarkably here i think more than anything else the works of art that we see that are the most emotionally moving or the ones that speak to us more wholeheartedly are works that are photojournalistic um, or that commemorate something that was very emotionally moving for us. And the, in this case, um, I would say that this work of art very much is that. It goes along with the work of art that is next. Um, this happened to be a shot that the photographer took after um, the American soldiers were helping the women uh, in the village escape the Agent Orange attack. Um, this particular photo is from 1972. 
And yes, it is part of your photography since the 1950s lecture. It's just I like to put it in this section because it's very much about conceptualism. There was a photographer named Nick Oot. He was an Associated Press photographer, and he was shooting photos outside of Trang Bang Village from South Vietnam when the South Vietnamese planes accidentally dropped napalm, which is Agent Orange made from petroleum explosion, um, er, from petroleum. It explodes on impact and sticks to things like wax. The napalm literally eats this skin of the victim. Um, the bombs were dropped on Trang Bang, which had been occupied by the North Vietnamese. Um, the troops uh, were trying to help and um, help uh, the, wait a minute, the bomb. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's back up the choo-choo here a minute. Um, the South Vietnamese planes accidentally dropped napalm on the North Vietnamese village. Um, it was in a village called Trang Bang. Um, Trang Bang had been occupied by the North Vietnamese troops. And um, this nine-year-old girl, Kim Fuk, was with a group of civilians who were trying to flee the village when the planes mistook them for soldiers. Um, and that's why they dropped the napalm on the village. Um, Oot captures this image of Kim Fuk and others running out of the bombed village. Uh, she was naked because she had her clothes um, burned off. Um, they knew that the Agent Orange was sticking to her clothes, and so they helped her pull them off. Um, they ran quickly to help save her life. Uh, Forty years later, uh, Oot, the photographer, and Kim still stay in touch. Um, because of this tragic and infamous picture, their lives have really become intertwined forever. Oot won a Pulitzer Prize for the spot news photography that he did in 1973. Um, and in, of this particular photograph, um, her name is Fan Tai Kim Fook. Um, and so they still keep in touch. This is one of the most moving pictures in contemporary art that I can think of. And I had to share it with you. Um, this is another one of those famine in Somalia pictures from 1992. We're going to look a lot of 1990s art right now. Um, it, there was this photographer named James... Nakachawe, and he couldn't get an assignment um, to document the spiraling famine in Somalia. Um, Mugadishu, Mugadishu had become engulfed in armed conflict because food prices were soaring and international food assistance was failing to be delivered. Um, if you don't know a whole lot about the countries of Africa, what I can tell you is that they're in the middle of a very uh, trying situation. The trying situation comes from the fact that they were colonized. Um, when they were colonized, European countries came in and took over the economy, took over the way they traded, took over everything. Um, and one day, the European colonization just pulls out. They just leave. And they basically leave the country and scrambles trying to organize some sense of leadership. And special interest groups become 
uh, trying to take control of the individual countries, which is something has that has happened in Somalia. Um, many countries have tried to send uh, food as support for the famine. Um, and unfortunately, it's stopped by rebel forces. It's taken. There's just, it's not an easy situation. And it was really bad in 1992. And so this photographer desperately wanted to document it to get their story out. Um, and so he received support from the International Committee of the Red Cross, and he brings back a cache of these haunting images, um, this young woman in the wheelbarrow um, had been taken to a feeding center from her village uh, and was published as the cover for the New York Times Magazine. One reader wrote, dare we say that it doesn't get any worse than this. The world has similarly moved. Um, the Red Cross said public support resulted in what was then its largest operation since World War II. So photography seems to move people enough that someone wants to do something about it. This is photojournalism at its best resource, right? It's how we use photojournalism to change the world. Um, one and a half million people were uh, saved in the Red Cross's efforts. Um, and it was James Natachaway's pictures that made the difference for this community. So this particular work of art is by Wafa Bilal. Um, I hope I pronounced that right. My uh, Middle Eastern pronunciation of names is not so hot. Um, but Wafa's, Waf, Wafa'a Bilaz um, grew up in Iraq. He was defined by uh, the rule of Saddam Hussein. Um, there were two wars in his lifetime and a really awful uprising. Um, and he spent time in a refugee camp in Kuwait. He eventually makes it to the U.S. to become a professor and a successful artist, um, but his brother was killed at a U.S. checkpoint in 2005, and he decided to use his art to confront those in the comfort zone with the realities of life in a conflict zone. Um, and so the creation and staging of this work of art called Domestic Tension is an unsettling interna interactive performance piece. For one month, Bayal lived alone in a prison cell-sized room in the line of fire of a remote-controlled paint gun and a camera that was connected to him. Internet viewers around the world could watch him. Um, visitors to the gallery and a virtual audience um, grew by the thousands and could see him 24 hours a day. The project really seemed it received a lot of worldwide attention. Um, the Chicago Tribune called it one of the sharpest works of political art to be seen in a long time. Um, Newsweek said it was breathtaking. It spawns a proactive online debate um, and by all eventually was awarded the Chicago Tribune's Artist of the Year Award for this work of art. Um, it was structured in two parallel, parallel narratives, the story of Bailao's life journey and the domestic tension experience, um, of the, which was addressed by a first-person account, um, which was supplemented with comments on the history and current political situation in Iraq. Um, 
there were many interviews with art scholars like the Dean of the School of Art of Columbia University. Um, and so that helped sort of propel it in terms of getting its message across. Um, Shoot in Iraq is equally pertinent reading for those who seek insight into the current conflict in Iraq. For those who are fascinated by interactive art technologies in the ever-expanding world of online gaming, um, this becomes an interesting work of art as well. Um, this particular work is by All right, so now we're going to look at Robert Makebull Thorpe, and I just kind of felt like you can't talk about contemporary art without talking about Robert Maple Thorpe. Um, he was born in 1946 in Queens. Um, he said about his childhood, I come from suburban America. It was a very safe environment, and it was a good place to come from in that it was a good place to leave. Um, Maple Thorpe went to Pratt um, near Brooklyn, and he studied drawing, painting, and sculpture there. He was influenced by artists like Joseph Cornell, uh, Marcel Duchamp. He also experimented with various materials and mixed media collage, um, including cut books and magazines. He acquires a Polaroid camera in 1970 and begins producing his own photographs to incorporate in the collages. Um, he felt like the collage was more honest by doing that. Um, the same year, he and Patti Smith um, move into the Chelsea Hotel. He finds uh, happiness <laughs> taking Polaroids um, photographs uh, of their own and um, putting them in his mixed media work. There's a gallery in New York City that mounts his very first solo exhibition in 1973 and it's all of Polaroids. Um, A little bit later, he find, he gets a Hasselbed medium format camera and begins um, taking him in pictures of just his friends and acquaintances, um, artists, musicians, socialites, porn stars, film stars, um, members of the SMN un, S and M underground. He works on commercial projects uh, and creates an album. Oh, creates album cover art uh, for Patti Smith. Um, he meets Lisa Lyon, who's the um, first world women's bodybuilding champion. Um, and over the next few years, they collaborate. They do a series of portraits, um, a film, and a book. In the 80s, Mablethorpe produces a large array of images that challenge and adhere to classical aesthetic standards. Um, he does some stylized compositions of male and female nudes, um, delicate flowers, still lives, but the studio portraits of the celebrities were really the ones that um, people were drawn to. Uh, he starts refining his technique um, and includes some Polaroids in the technique um, and then starts printing on linen paper. He begins designing sets for Lucinda Childs, um, who's a dancer. And in 1986, he's diagnosed with AIDS. Um, he 
He continues to work, though, and he accepts more and more challenging commissions. Um, the Whitney Museum of American Art mounts his first major American exhibition in 1988, a year before he dies in 89. Here's his image of Andy Warhol taken during that time. Um, he really steps up his creative efforts um, when he's diagnosed um, because he wants a legacy to leave behind. His work can be very provocative, but it established him as one of the most important artists of the 20th century. Um, today, Maplethorpe's represented by galleries in North and South America and Europe. You can find his collections in major museums around the world. Um, just beyond that, the art, historical, and social significance of his work, his legacy lives through um, a foundation that he established called the Robert Maplethorpe Foundation. Um, it was established in 1988 to promote photography, um, support museums that exhibit photographic art, and to fund medical research to fight AIDS and HIV-related infection. Um, he knew lots of celebrities. He enjoyed taking pictures of the unique individuals. Andy Warhol is very similar to that in his photography. All right, so now we get to talk about Catherine Opie, who is probably one of my favorite artists um, in, in the, of all time. Um, she's from Cleveland. And she likes to take pictures of landscapes. Um, but at some point she turns her focus on landscapes to people. Um, she said that we all miss certain people as we sort of race throughout our lives. Um, she's most known for her formal color saturated portraits. Um, these are pieces that use classic portraiture, but she takes images of um, contemporary subjects, um, transgender subjects, pierced and scarred, bleeding, cross-dressers, subjects that are confronted, that confront the viewer with defiant um, imagery. Um, imagery of confident and curious people. Um, Opie says about her work, if you are going to make color photographs, then play with the color. Uh, and we definitely see that. This is a really good example. This is Jerome Kaja. Um, she took this picture in 93. She likes to capture people at moments when um, you know, we would sort of be going about our everyday lives and then all of a sudden up pops, um, an unusual couple and a person who you don't see every day, something unique about the person. Um, She often takes images with lots of different props. You can see that this particular image has a person, um, has Jerome dressed in the lower right hand corner with glasses and then in the upper left hand without them. Um, here, Jerome wears red feathered shoes um, in a prom dress. And she puts the image um, in front of this bright green background. 
um, because the background has ambiguity. She likes to have a formal setup of her photos um, in which she sort of sets up this professional um, photo studio type environment. She lives in Los Angeles now, but like I said, she's from Cleveland. She started out taking landscapes of Lake Erie. The thing about her pictures um, is that most of them sort of have the just typical everyday run-of-the-mill portrait style to them. It's just a person sitting there having a picture taken, but she purposely um, takes images of people who you wouldn't see every day on the street. I would say somewhat similar to... Um, Diane Arbus. But she makes sure that she portrays her subject in a dignified, beautiful way, um, sometimes hinging on provocative. Oftentimes, the subject that she's taking a picture of is just a single sitter. Um, and You can see when you put them all in their own body of work that she's excellent at posing gender questions. And what I mean by this is she sort of blurs the division between um, gender. So this particular image, for example, is one in which she takes a picture of a child who doesn't have a gender identification to them. Uh, it, the child has long hair, so you don't know, because boys and girls both can wear their hair long. The child isn't wearing a shirt that is overly girly or overly guyish, and just a pair of jeans, um, set against this red background to sort of make the yellow, um, pop. It's just gender bends, and she really likes that sense of being able to, um, create an image in which she's asking the viewer to stop and sort of discuss with her how they identify gender. She was trying to document the LGBTQ community um, for a sense of cultural identity. There's a sense of loneliness that comes from her work because the people that she photographs are people who are on the marginalized in society. Um, this image is done of Melissa and Lake. Um, they are her friends. She said she was highly influenced by um, Walker Evans, Lewis Hine, Dorothea Lang. Um, she got her MFA in the California Institute of Arts in 1988. Um, and focused in gender and sexual identities. Uh, she also explored notions of community or the myth of the American dream. And she follows this in her 1990 portrait series um, where she's photographing transgender women and men, drag queens, um, in a sense of formality, in a sense of 
Um, these people are people that tend to be stuck on the outskirts of society and she sort of likens them to just any other person um, by documenting their stories, by photographing their um, images in a formal way. Um, she relied on the historical formal elements of photography, um, on, of studio portraiture, and then turned the heterosexual normative world upside down, um, to get beautiful pictures of beautiful people. Okay. We're going to try this over again. This is the fourth time I've tried to um, record my bit about this particular image. It is because my 18-pound uh, chihuahua is yapping her head off. Big chihuahua, I know she's a mix. At any rate, if you hear a little yapper, it's just her. I put her outside and shut all the windows, but she's noisy. Sorry about that. Okay, so... That makes light of this particular photograph, which is a fairly heavy image. Um, this photograph was done or taken by an artist. Her name is Teresa Frar. She was a student at OU in the 90s when this um, image was taken. And the person that you see in the photograph that is passing away, his name is David Kirby. David Kirby was um, born in Ohio and raised in a small town in Ohio. He was gay and became a gay activist in 1980. Um, in the late 80s, he was living in California and was estranged from his family and realized that he had contracted HIV. Um, he got in touch with his parents and asked if he could come home. He wanted to be around his family and the Kirby's were thrilled to reconcile with David. Um, David unfortunately lost his fight with HIV AIDS and ended up in an AIDS hospice center. Um, Teresa Farr volunteered for the AIDS hospice center through a local church that she had come to um, know. She, Teresa Farr, talks about um, her experience that day, and I, I just want to read it for you. Some of the staff came in to get PETA so he could be with David, and he took me with him. I stayed outside David's room, minding my own business, when David's mom came out and told me the family wanted me to photograph people saying their final goodbyes. I went in and stood quietly in the corner, barely moving, watching the photograph, watching and photographing the scene. Afterwards, I knew, I absolutely knew, that something truly incredible had unfolded in that room right in front of me. Early on, Far says her time at the Pastor Noster house, which was the um, hospice house, I asked David if he minded me taking pictures. And he said, that's fine, as long as it's not for personal profit. To this day, I don't take any money for the picture, but David was an activist, and he wanted to get the word out about the devastating AIDS that was, about how devastating AIDS was to his family and community. Honestly, I think he was a lot more in tune with how important these photos might become. For our pauses and laughs. At the time, I was like, besides, who's going to see these pictures anyway? <laughs> Over the past 20 years, as many as 1 billion people have seen this now iconic photograph that appeared in Life magazine. Um, it was reproduced for hundreds of newspaper magazines, ads, and TV stories all over the world. Teresa was able to capture the humanity behind AIDS when you look at this person in their deathbed with their family saying goodbye you don't see the LGBTQ community you don't see 
the disease. You just simply see the humanity of dying. And so this photograph became one of the most important photographs in journal photolism, journal photo, photojournalism, sorry, of all times. Um, it won a World Press Photo Award um, when it was published in Life. But two years later, it really became the voice that it was because Benetton used it um, in a provocative ad campaign. It was used to promote AIDS activism and to voice the outrage of the AIDS virus. Um, there was a high profile AIDS charity in England that um, said that the ad was offensive and then powerhouse magazines like Elle and Vogue and Marie Claire refused to run the Benetton ad. Um, for those of you that don't know, Benetton is a, um, it's a clothing label that was really popular in the 90s. Kirby's family talks about the ad and says he really didn't, they really didn't think anything of using this, uh, of letting Benetton use the photograph. Um, she says that um, the grisly side of the disease was that Kirby pretty much starved to death at the end when he died. Um, he was 32 years old and he passed away on April, he passed away in April of 1990. Favre began spending more time at the AIDS Hospice Center. She, um, took pictures of David Kirby, but she also took pictures of another man who was there named PETA, who was also HIV positive. Um, she became sort of known for the woman that took the AIDS photograph. Um, this photograph in terms of photojournalism was just as groundbreaking as Dorothea Lange's work um, because it humanized the, the side of AIDS. Um, and it's, I stick it in the LGBTQ section whenever I do the contemporary art because you have to sort of um, group things together somehow so you can kind of understand the presentation topics but um, this is one of those photographs that I hope whenever you are sitting down to work on a work of art and you think I really want to move people emotionally you draw back into your head on these images by life these images that Dorothea Lange had created the images that I showed you of um, Catherine Opie and um, the way that she photographed folks um, and I think the way that you see the emaciated woman from um, Ethiopia those type of shocking drastic but important images are ones that have shaped photojournalism today. This is the colored photograph that Benetton um, used. All right, so this particular work is by Greer Langton, um, and it's titled, It's All About Me, Not You. It is an installation, and if you ever go to the Mattress Factory, 
Uh, I usually go every year. We didn't go this year just because COVID was crazy and um, the semester kind of got away from me. But um, I always invite you to go when I go to the Mattress Factory and when I go to Pittsburgh to see Andy Warhol's museum. And um, this particular image that you see in front of you is an installation. Uh, it's an installation in which you stand at a trailer door and look inside the room and Greer Langton has sculpted um, her experience. She lays in a bed with bottles, pill bottles, all over her body because she too died of AIDS. Um, she was transgender and was a sex worker trying to work out her gender identity. Every image of a person that you see in here in this room is an image of Greer Langton and how she saw herself in different ways. The images are about her faith. She was Catholic. Um, she tried very hard to reason with or recognize her transgenderness um, and how that all fit into her Catholic upbringing, her sex worker work, her, um, her dying of AIDS. At any rate, um, it's titled It's All About Me, Not You because she's discussing her feelings about the disease. She's discussing her feelings about her gender identity She's trying to figure out who she is, um, but yet so many people have an opinion about her transgender status. Um, you see body parts hanging on the wall. This work of art is very much a self-portrait of Greer Langton. If you haven't ever seen Greer Langton's work, I highly encourage you to look it up. It is fascinating body of work. Um, she drew quite a bit, uh, but I think her most fascinating works are these works that are, um, they are uh, installations. So um, here are a couple other views of the installation. You can see in the image on the right hand side, all the pill bottles that are all around her. Um, one of the things I had forgotten about Greer Langton as I was getting these additional images for you that the Mattress Factory reminded me of is that Langton was um, a child of, um, she went through some trauma as a child and she was anorexic and had, um, um, an addiction problem um, from a fairly young age. She was about 12 when she started using. Um, her works are very autobiographical, which I'm sure you can see. Um, they reveal her obsessions. So drugs, icons, um, dolls. You can see in the image on the right hand side, all the dolls that she collected. Um, environments seem to be a mix of decadence, innocence, um, pathos. She said that this work reflected her life as an artist and as a transgender person and as a drug addict. Um, I'm sorry that I told you she died of AIDS. She didn't. She died of a drug overdose. Um, she was questioning gender norms and sexuality as well as um, uh, she says that some of her work is about consumerism. So I highly encourage you to find out more about Greer Langton. She's just a fascinating artist. Um, it really does beautiful work with the imagery of the doll. 
So this next work is by David, and I never say his name well, Wojnarowicz. Um, he was a photographer, writer, filmmaker, performance artist, and an activist. Um, and he was mostly prominent in New York City in the 80s. He was born in Red Bank, which is a town in New Jersey, in 1954. And he had a tough childhood. Um, he lived with an abusive family um, at, based on his sexual orientation. And he dropped out of high school and began living on the streets at the age of 16. Um, he turns to hustling in order to make ends meet um, and hitchhikes across the United States to San Francisco. Somehow he ends up in Paris, um, but he settles in New York in the East Village in 1987. Um, his works incorporate, or incorporate the outsider experience drawn from his personal history and stories um, that he heard from the people that he mes met in bus stations and truck stops while hijacking or hitchhiking. Um, by the late 1970s, he had, in his own words, started developing ideas of making and preserving an authentic version of history in the form of images, writings, objects that he that would contest state-supported forms of history. Um, He produced a collection of monologues and an arrangement of black and white photographs. The photographs were taken when he traveled um, across the United States, but he really wanted to give a voice to the people that were stigmatized in society. Um, he was a member of the first wave of East Village artists and began showing work during the early 1980s um, in a space that's now legendary, um, like Club 57, Civilian Warfare, Grace, the Gracie Mansion, Fashion Moda, the Limbo Lounge. Um, but he really gained his prominence through his inclusion in the Whitney Biannual in 1985. Um, through his exposure in the art galleries in New York City, he was invited to show at the Whitney Biennial. Um, that show traveled um, into gallery exhibitions throughout the United States, Europe, and Latin America. He was diagnosed with AIDS in the um, late 80s, and his art takes a political um, edge. He was soon thrown into highly public debates about medical research and funding, morality and censorship of the arts, and the legal rights of the artist. Um, he challenged the nature of public arts funding on the National Endowment for the Arts. I wonder how many of you really know how much money each person in the United States pays for the National Endowment for the Arts from their taxes. If I was in class, I would ask you all to guess. But because we're not in class, I can't. So I'm just going to tell you. It was 50 cents a person. 50 cents a person is what each American who works, just American taxpayers, pay to go to the National Endowment for the Arts. Artists like Robert Maplethorpe, was Jorna Wick, um, Andre Serrano, who we're going to look at here in a minute. Their art was funded through the National Endowment for the Arts. And so when people find that the thing that they are funding is something that they don't morally agree with, it becomes a hotbed issue in contemporary art. Um, a lot of times contemporary artists like to expose the controversial. Um, it, it's not that art that isn't controversial doesn't make a big statement, but 
the ones that are remembered are the ones that are how oh, more controversial, so to speak. And so his art often spurs a reaction of um, debate. Wojarnowicz dies of AIDS-related illnesses in um, New York City in 92. He was only 37 years old. Um, he wrote five books. His artwork is in numerous private and public collections, including the MoMA in New York and the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, he also has an estate that's still being preserved um, today. This is the art of James Luna. Um, we get to sort of move to <laughs> a new topic. James Luna is Native American. He lives in um, on a reservation out west. And he likes to do works of art that sort of combine performance art with uh, visual art um this image or this particular work of art uh called the artifact piece is one in which he builds this artifact display case and lays inside the display case as a statement to say um i am a living person I am the artifact that you seek. Um, it was sort of his way of protesting that his um, heritage and cultural identity wasn't being respected. Um, I saw a work of his an installation of his for the first time in um, Washington, D.C. at the Native American Institute owned by the Smithsonian, the Native American Cultural Center owned by the Smithsonian. And the one thing that you learn is that um, Native American culture is highly protected. Um, people who have Native American heritage, are very proud of their Native American heritage. Um, you're not allowed to just participate because you think it's interesting. Um, and the things that they have that we as scholars consider art are things that are their everyday way of life and they feel disrespected when somebody wants to take something and shove it in a museum. Um, they feel that they deserve more, um, oh, I want to say validity in terms of objects, um, the objects that they have are things that are often, um, sacred objects and they are not culturally respected at all. Okay. This next artist, once again, is another one of my absolute favorite artists. This is why I like this particular um, lecture, because all of my favorite people are represent, or all of my favorite artists are represented in the um, lecture. But uh, at any rate, this, this art is by a woman named Serene Neshat. Serene Neshat was... Um, a teenager in the 70s and I think grew up in a fairly affluent home in Iran and when she graduated from high school she decided she was going to go to college she wanted to go to Los Angeles for college and so she went to Los Angeles for college and when she left um, everybody in her area were wearing mini skirts and they were just a pretty westernized group of people in society um she was born in kazvin 
which was a small city a couple hours from Tehran. Um, she was born in 1957, so that tells you about how old she is. Um, and the Islamic Revolution happened in 1979 that prevented her from going back to her country for almost 20 years. Um, she got a BA from the University of California at Berkeley, and she moved to New York where she began to work um, at a storefront uh, where she would design window fronts for a store. Um, her arrival at New York sort of made her take an hi a hiatus from art um, until she made her first trip back to Iran in 1993. Um, she begins photographing at that point and she's exploring the notions of femininity um, in relationship to Islamic fundamentalism. You see, when she grew up in Iran, nothing there was uh, what she considered to be oppressive. Um, everybody dressed how they wanted, most people wore what they wanted. Um, the uh, ex extremists that took over their, her er the area in which she grew up um, took over after she left. And so the world that she returned to in 93 was very different than the world she grew up in. And so her work was meant to um, help her work out how she felt about the change in um, society, in her world, in the world around her, um, where she grew up. So these are images like the one that I just spoke of, um, where she uses images of the female to um, create a dialogue about how she feels in terms of um, Islam, she does not consider herself to be Islamic. Um, she thinks that the Quran is a beautiful um, spoken word, but she isn't a practicing Muslim. Um, and really when we look at these photographs, we see through our Western eyes, we see this idea that um, Middle Eastern women are oppressed, or that Serene Neshat feels oppressed. The interesting thing about that is Serene Neshat will tell you that she, she never once felt oppressed. She never grew up particularly feeling as if um, she needed to cover her entire body or not wear jeans. Um, it was only after um, she left Iran and went back in the 90s that she began to start working out the new order of things in um, the area that she grew up. This is another one of those photographs. Um, it's titled, I'm a Secret by Serene Neshat. And I think that this photograph um, may be about how her family feels or how her family kind of has kept her quiet based on the fact that they all still live in um, the area that she grew up in today. Uh, she has focused on filmmaking more so um, now in contemporary art than she has in her photographs. Um, some of the people that she's met in the filmmaking industry have been able to help her um, produce the images and the film that she wants to produce. She's really much more of a conceptual artist than she is a photographer. Um, some of the images that you see are images that she didn't actually um, take herself. 
Um, someone else was the one that did the photography, but she's the one who produced the idea. She's the one that came up with the idea. She's the one that um, uh, is considered the artist because it was her original thought. Um, she produced a series. This piece is such a cool piece. It's by Wenda Gu. It's from the United Nations China Monument Temple of Heaven from 1998. Um, these, the screens that hang across the top uh, that drape to create the ceiling are screens that are woven from human hair. Um, the human hair that's used to create the dark color in the screens come from a large background of different ethnicities. Um, Gu's idea was to unite cultures around the world um, by using hair from people around the world. Um, he paints with something called an ideogram, which is a symbol that conveys the meaning of a word. Um, Oh, I can't think of a good ideogram right off of the top of my head. Um, but the paintbrush that he uses is also made of human hair. Um, um, this particular work that Gu takes on is, um, resembles a Buddhist temple and the tea ceremony that takes place in the Buddhist temple. There are video monitors on the seats of the chairs that have pictures of clouds on them to give the viewer the idea that they're in the heavens. Um, he creates United Nations monuments that have been made in more than 20 countries around the world. Um, and more than a million people have contributed hair to his work. Gu states that he wants to create works in every country so that someday all of humanity will be linked all together.